Welcome to the ISF Podcast from the Information Security Forum. The ISF Podcast is hosted by ISF CEO Steve Durbin, and every episode he brings listeners features timely conversations, practical insights, and resources for global cybersecurity professionals. I'm producer Tavia Gilbert. Today is the final episode of our special series, marking Cyber Awareness Month. ISF Regional Director for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, Dan Norman, speaks with Steve about how organizations can ensure that security is a concern for everyone, from the top down. They discuss questions of education, technology, and best practices for a post-COVID workforce. We're going to be talking about a theme that is is essentially relevant for everyone. And the topic is, why should security be everyone's problem? And I think what's happened over the last few years, especially touching on COVID, is there's a number of organisational changes that have happened. And that has had a subsequent impact on security behaviour, on how individuals collaborate and work. But in your opinion, Steve, what post-COVID changes to the workforce, to how we work, how we use technology, do you think are here to stay? Hmm. It's a really good uh, way to start, isn't it? Um, Trying to sort of forecast the future with that one. I think that what we're seeing post-COVID is a number of organisations that are really, and I don't think struggling is too strong a word, I think they are struggling to come to terms with, are you going to be you know, a hybrid organisation, are you going to be fully remote, are you going to be office-based? And I think that's causing a degree of confusion in the space. So from a security standpoint, of course, life becomes relatively simple. And you don't often hear me say that. Um, Because the security departments have had to cope with all of the different things that went on in COVID. So they moved from everybody being in one location to everybody having to be remote. Uh, And so bringing people back in to a greater or lesser extent, I think makes life a little easier from a security standpoint. But where's it all going to end up? I think that, again, it comes down to the organisational need. I I think that you will see organisations very much like our own that have decided that, you know, hybrid is the way to go for us. I've said consistently that I I see absolutely no point in forcing people onto public transport or into cars or aeroplanes when they don't need to, when they can do that equally well from a remote location. So I think that what we're going to start seeing, which does raise another challenge from a security standpoint, is people being much more comfortable about working in remote locations. And And I probably need to explain a bit what I mean by that, because I think you're going to have a headquarter type environment, you're going to have people working from home, and then you're going to have people who get together because they happen to live closely. And that could be in a hotel, it could be in a coffee shop, it could be in all of the other sorts of areas that are currently springing up, you know, locations that are rented by the day, by the week, and, and, and so on. And from a security standpoint, that does bring in some real challenges because now we have to think through what are the the rules, the policies, the guidelines that we're going to be implementing around the use, perhaps, of public Wi-Fi. And again, that means we're going to have to look very carefully at the data rather than the environment, because that's what's important. And and I think that's the real challenge from a security standpoint. But I don't see us landing on any one particular solution for a while to come, because I think a lot of organisations are still finding their way. I think... A logical sort of follow-up question here, Steve, is if there is a hybrid or semi-hybrid remote working environment, what can organisations do to ensure that information security is top of mind for employees that they're either not seeing every day Mm. or they're communicating with significantly less? Yeah. I think it is, you know, I go back to what I said earlier, I think it is about the data. I think that from a security standpoint, we need to be really smart about what data are we trying to protect. Because then we've got the context. So if I come along to you and I say, okay, Dan, by the way, our new policy is that you can't link to any of our systems if you're in an airport, in a hotel, or in a coffee shop. Well, that's pretty much your job done. I mean, where do you go? You know, you're out on the road, you're doing a whole pile of different things. So I've shut all of that down. 
If, on the other hand, I say to you, Dan, if you're going to be accessing some key data from a remote location, that needs to be on a VPN, or that can only be in a secure environment. And I explain to you why you need to do that. You're probably going to be more engaged. So I think that the challenge from a security standpoint is about explaining the why. And traditionally, security hasn't been that good about that because we've centered much more on policies, on processes, and this is the way that you do it. So explaining the why to get buy-in from people is hugely important. And we shouldn't be overburdening them. So the work needs to be done by security around what are the critical assets, how do we have to protect them, and then explaining that to the people that are accessing them, updating them, using them, doing whatever they're doing. Absolutely. I was going to mention the importance of effective asset management mm. and understanding the data that all people use within the organisation. I think that's fundamental from what you've said there. But that leads me to our, our next question, really, and that's what will the major security behaviour and culture challenges be in 2024 through the lens of, let's say, we're seeing a lot of emerging technologies being used, mm -hmm. machine learning, AI. What do you think the challenges will be for people using them? Yeah, I, I think that ChatGPT is a good example, isn't it? Because this year we've seen that really sort of explode onto the corporate uh, seen. I mean, there was a period I know through sort of late spring, early summer, where everybody that I spoke to wanted to get a view on, on what should we be doing about ChatGPT, for instance. And I think, again, and this is going to sound really boring, I come back to the same thing. It depends. It depends on the organisation. It depends on the role that you're playing. I think that what security has to do is be very much more aligned with where the business is going. So if, and let's stick with ChatGPT, if that is an important element for, let's say, marketing, then why shouldn't marketing be using it? You know, if they can produce marketing materials very much more quickly through a chat GPT plus a marketing manager route, then why shouldn't they be able to use that? So I've seen some, some real sort of blanket bans, which I think is the wrong way to go. And that doesn't help anybody and, and people just find a way around it. I've seen not enough really thinking about how we might be able to use some of these emerging, evolving technologies and what we can do with that. And that, I think, is the way that we have to go. That means security has to be much more hand in glove with the business, it has to get the advice of the business, the support of the business. And uh, as I've been saying for, for some while now, and, and I know a number of security people don't like it, have to operate very much more as consultants to the business because you know, there is a business strategy that is geared around delivering a certain amount of revenue and growth and new product development and all of those sorts of things. And security has to support all of that and provide the right advice and guidance at each and every stage. So that's really the way that I see things perhaps um, evolving. I just want to unpackage that a little bit because mm. I think a lot of, especially at the chapter meetings that I've been at, they are taking sort of blanket policy approaches to emerging technology without really understanding the use case. Yeah. It's kind of like scaremongering, looking mm -hmm. at the potential risk and then saying, no, we can't use it. But how does the security team change that approach? Because that, to me, sounds like a cultural shift away from being sort of a preventative barrier to, as you said, hand in glove. Mm -hmm. How do you change that? Is it top down? Is it bottom up? Or what do you recommend? I, I think it has to be top down. I think it has to come right from the board of directors through the chief executive down from that. And I think you know that's where we get into trouble perhaps because we need still to do a better job of raising awareness at that level of the real value that security can bring. And it isn't, as you say, about putting in these blanket policies that actually give security a bad reputation. You know, years ago, security always used to be seen as being the traffic cops, you know, the no guys. And what happened? Well, people went around them. And then we had shadow IT. And that's not what we want to get back to. So I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done probably by the CISO in terms of helping the C-suite understand the importance of security. Helping, I think, by working with the CTO or the CEO or the technology people as well to position some of these things that are emerging. 
and to come up with a solution that's in the best interest of the business that can be implemented across then all of the different business units. But I think that it really is a retrograde step to have these blanket bans. And, and it, it doesn't help. Actually, what it does is it alienates and it probably takes us back to a place that I had hoped we'd left some years ago. Mm. One final question here, and I really want to go back to the title, which was making security everyone's problem. Mm -hmm. What role do you think that awareness, training and education should play moving forward? Is there anything that we're doing now that's just archaic or are there any approaches that you'd recommend that are more transformative? I, I think education, awareness, they're fundamental. Because, you know, we, we talk about the speed of change. And so we have to, from a security awareness and a security education perspective, make sure that people who are using the technology, the tools, are aware of what they should or shouldn't be doing and why. So what could we do better? I think we could be a lot more in the moment. So I, I'm not a big fan, for instance, of running you know, right on Monday, we're going to start a particular uh, phishing test and at the end of two weeks, we'll report back on how that went. No, you've got to do things in the moment. So I need to get feedback on the fact that perhaps I've accessed something that I shouldn't have when I'm accessing it, along with some education around how I could avoid doing it in the future, because I'm therefore engaged in it. If you come back to me in a week's time and say, Steve, by the way, you know when you opened that email or when you visited that site, I won't have the first clue what you're talking about. And so that's one of the things that we need to get much, much better at. So in the moment feedback. I think that also leads me on to having um, more of a security function that is put out into the business department. So again, people can actually ask you know, do you know who to go to? If you see something that looks a little bit off, what do you do? It's very easy to go and ask somebody. If you know that your nominated person is, you know, I don't know, Sarah, who sits down at, you know, wherever she happens to be, or online or whatever it is. So again, in the moment, a point of reference. Where can I go to get advice on what I should do? We need to be better at that. But it all comes back, I think, to the way that we started talking, which is, you know, really understanding the value of data, because you're not going to do that for everything across the enterprise. And so we need to do a better job of data segmentation, data analysis, understanding which data really is key, which needs to be protected, and frankly, which elements of it are, okay, it's not a today problem, but we need to address it tomorrow. And I think that includes not just your own organization, but all of the suppliers that you share data with as well. Yeah, I think to sort of summarize, I guess it has to have a high degree of relevance to yep. the roles. We have to understand the threat landscape, the specific risks to different user groups. So thank you very much, Steve. Some really unique insights there. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to Dan and Steve for our special Cyber Awareness Month series. ISF members, be sure to log in to ISF Live to access all of our comprehensive research, reports, and tools related to these conversations. And to our listeners who want to become an ISF member, get in touch with your regional representative at securityforum.org forward slash join. We'll be back soon with another valuable conversation. And in the meantime, be sure to check out the ISF Analyst Insight podcast, which goes in-depth on the hottest topics in information security. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert, with senior producer Katie Flood. Mix and master by Kayla Elrod. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Thanks for listening.